for anybody listening that's wondering how to start, there is no easy way. You have to just be willing to say no. Business of Architecture, episode 288. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the Business of Architecture show, the show for architects who want to maximize and excel in three areas of their practice and life, fulfillment, freedom, and finances. Today, I have the pleasure of having Eric Corey Freed on the show today. Eric Corey Freed is an award-winning architect, 11-time author, speaker, and self-proclaimed comedian. When Eric was 25 years old, noted architect and critic Philip Johnson described him as one of the real brains of his generation. Today, Eric continues the tradition of organic architecture, first developed and promulgated by Frank Lloyd Wright. As a licensed architect, Eric brings over 25 years of experience in helping architects, builders, and homeowners use sustainability to improve the design and operational savings for thousands of buildings across the country. Eric has helped thousands of companies monetize sustainability by showing them how to cut their real estate operation costs. Companies like Autodesk, Pixar, Apple, and Lowe's have hired Eric to help them incorporate deeper sustainability into their businesses. Currently, He is the sustainability disruptor at Morrison Hirschfield, where he identifies solutions to problems most teams don't know we're holding them back. I'm glad to have Eric on the show today because not only is he going to talk about the current state of building the AEC industry and some of the problems that our society today is facing, but also for those of you who are looking for ways to express your passion for architecture and the built environment in a non-traditional way. So Eric currently is not directly designing buildings, he consults. And this is very viable and can be a profitable and impactful path for someone who has the skills of an architect. So I hope you enjoy this interview. I know I had a a very enjoyable time speaking with Eric in today's episode. There's a lot of nuggets here. So without further ado, let's jump right on in to the episode. Here's Eric Corey Freed. Eric Corey Freed, welcome to the business of architecture. Thanks for having me back again. Great to be here. Absolutely. So you sent me the link to a recent TED talk you did and you've been quoted as saying the way we build is stupid. (laughs) It is. It is totally stupid. You know, I I had an inkling that it was stupid. Um, When I first started studying for my architect's license exams, I was given an old book from the 70s to study from. And, And the guys that gave it to me said, well, we've been building the same way. It's fine. You know, we, a brick is still a brick. And at, and at the time, that made total sense. But now, as, as we get deep into the 21st century, I'm realizing how preposterous it is that we've been building the same way for 200 years. It, it, and, it, and the more you think about it, the more you realize how there's really very little other things in your life where you're still relying on a 200-year-old technology. Maybe you know, someone, someone uh, in one of my audiences, someone mentioned... Um, that we still use a pencil and that's a 200 year old technology. And that kind of stumped me. But otherwise, given everything that we've learned about um, environment and climate change and the climate crisis and asthma and endocrine disruption and indoor air quality and parametric modeling and 3D printing, and it just seems silly to still be stacking things together and bolting them together and hoping they don't leak. Why do you think that the AEC industry hasn't innovated as much as it could have over the past 200 years? There's not a single, there's not a single thing to point to, but first of all, we don't really have an established research and development component to practice. There are, there are, you know, there are people that have it within their practice. If you think of Frank Geary or you think of Tom Main you know, having, having kind of encountered both of those firms and seeing how they handle it, they have it built in, but there are, they are certainly the exception, not the rule. The majority of firms are trying to build their projects without getting sued and, and by creating a, you know, eking out a little bit of profit. And so there's not a lot of room in there for exploration or experimentation. And our entire industry is really very risk adverse. It's really designed to mitigate all, all that risk. So you're not going to want to take certain leaps in design beyond the aesthetic. So let's take this idea that the industry is stacked against innovation, right? It's a broad statement, (laughs) but you mentioned some outside forces and and some internal resistance to really thinking outside the box or maybe experimenting, doing research and design. 
we know the innovation and you're making the case that innovation is necessary. So whether it comes from inside or from outside, it's going to happen. How do you, how do you see it happening and how do you see architects being able to participate in that innovation? I don't see innovation happening from within the profession. And if you think about it, we have, there's a history of this, right? The, um, the post office did not invent email. The biggest disruption to that came from outside. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the candle industry did not invent the light bulb. That's not how that works. It's, it's, it was really about some disruptive outside force. And frankly, I think the biggest potential disruptors going on in our industry right now are Airbnb, WeWork, Google, Facebook, just to name the tech companies that are looking at it in terms of a disruptable space to be in. But then on, even in, inside the construction industry, the Kateras of the world that are really looking to upend this whole thing, those fascinate me, those interest me. And, um, and I've been paying very close attention to what they've been doing. Let's talk about that. Tell me about Katera. Well, I don't really know much more than you or what's on their website, really. I have friends that work there, but they're, they're sworn to secrecy. <laughs> but essentially, Katera is trying to do modular prefabricated construction in a way that scales. And I think for any architect, that's something that we've all been looking at, or at least uh, I've been obsessed with it. But they've been trying to do it in a real clear way. We're working on projects now where we're building prefabricated boxes. Unfortunately, they're in they're coming from Europe, but we're building these prefabricated boxes in, in Europe. We're shipping them to the States. We're stacking them up five high and we're just plugging them in and seeing if that can work in some way in terms of saving labor costs, material costs, improving sustainability, improving carbon footprint. And if I can make those boxes out of something like mass timber, then suddenly that's, that's pretty fascinating to me in terms of a, a carbon story and a climate, climate crisis story but also in terms of a scalability story. How close do you think we are to actually being able to utilize all these new technologies to be able to create some serious disruption or see some disruption in the way buildings are built? I, I think when I was working at the Living Future Institute, it was during the time that the Bullet Center kind of opened and came online and got its Living Building Challenge certification. And one of the things that I learned was the most important thing about the Bullet Center was that it exists, that they did it. Because the, the ripples that came out of that were huge. The mere fact that it exists, that there was this super green office building in Seattle, Washington, that the rest of the country could point to and say, and say look, look, it's, it's possible. That was the most important thing. And I think now, if you're looking at, you wanna prefabricate an entire building, either in components that you assemble like Ikea or even larger, or if you wanna 3D print you know, whole wall systems or something like that. I think we just need to get to a proof of concept where we get one project that exists. And I think that'll open the door for everybody. And that's right where we are. We're we're standing in this, I feel like we're standing in this threshold into that next future where we're letting go of this 200 year old idea of let's put it, put together little sticks of wood and metal and hope they don't leak. (laughs) <laughs> you've been talking about this for a long time. We connected about six years ago and you had a very similar message. So you've been focused on this for a while, just probably as long as anyone in the industry in terms of your career. What, what changes have you seen during that time? Are we really moving that direction? Just in the last five years, there's been some of the most exciting things I've ever seen in the construction industry in terms of accountability, responsibility, sustainability, transparency, Look at the entire transparency movement in terms of manufacturers and building materials with life cycle assessments, EPDs, and all that. Like, you know, now when you go to a mainstream show like AIA or uh, I'm going, you know, I speak at Neocon pretty much every year. Every booth is, is talking about their material transparency and disclosing the products that are in it. So we've, we've had some remarkable progress in the last five years. And then, and then, you know, friends of mine put together a website called mindfulmaterials.com that lets let's architects use it as a toolkit. It's a free toolkit for them to use to, uh, to really prioritize what they're, what they're interested in. So if they're, if they want to look at low carbon materials, they can sort by low carbon. If they want to look at low water or low energy or whatever, or health, they can go through their entire database and, and start making smarter selections. So we now have tools that we just didn't have five years ago. that are kind of remarkable. And I think that's just going to keep accelerating. And you mentioned a few things so far in the interview, but what are you excited about right now in terms of what you're seeing? 
What I'm most excited about is something that's not online, which is, which is what I've been working on for the last three years, which is the idea of employing biological technologies. And I'm not alone in this. There are lots of people working on this. I, I'm, I'm just, um, there's only a handful of us architects that are talking about it. But, but the idea that we would grow materials the way nature grows things, that we would employ DNA and natural processes to make materials instead of waiting for nature to grow something and then we cut it down and kill it and <laughs> slice it up and move it all over the planet. I'm talking about in situ growing things in place, like growing an entire building that you would inhabit, which sounds, I know it sounds science fiction-y, but, but it's actually possible, which is the craziest part. That in, in, our, in our work with this, we've discovered that there are, there are a whole group of biologists that are working towards this end. There's a whole group of architects that are talking about this. There are product manufacturers today that are delivering product that has been grown. And that to me is very fascinating. And that's what I'm obsessed with. Help me understand this idea of a grown building. What would it look like, at least theoretically? A grown and building, theoretically, but I mean, describe to me the, how this thing works. I think, I think there's, two, there's two basic forms it'll take. The first will be non-structural and the second will be structural. And so the non-structural one would be, imagine a skyscraper, you build all your steel framing right? It's pretty standard traditional thing, but all of the walls, all of the infill would be grown. You would essentially set some sort of biological thing, let's say, for lack of a better word, seeds that have been manipulated and you provide input, whether that's water or energy or whatever, whatever biological input it needs, and they would grow into place and then fit that wall. But the DNA would be such that you could design the wall to have openings of a specified size to have conduits if you wanted to. I mean, you could really do some amazing things. And this is not magic because you, you know, you and I are, are walking examples of this. We're, we're essentially carbon-based biological scaffolds where our structural system, muscular system, respiratory system all grew together at the same time. And then we didn't keep growing right around age 24 or 25, all of us kind of stopped growing. And then that's, Unfortunately for me, this is the height that I reached at age 25, and I'm not going to get any taller. So it's not like the building would just keep expanding and explode. I mean, it would you would reach a point of stasis, and then, um, and then and then just stop, and then we could inhabit it. That's really what I'm talking about. So, it, in a certain sense, it would almost look like everything else. You you probably wouldn't know, but in another sense, it would really solve a lot of the issues that we're facing now in terms of how to build affordably, how to build equitably how to build where we have a huge labor shortage as it is right now. Most people hear about this and say, well, if you want to grow buildings, you're, you're talking about putting contractors out of work. No, I'm trying to put more contractors into place because right now we don't have enough people to build the buildings that we need. We need to build essentially an area the size of New York City every five weeks for the next 33 years in order to meet our normal housing demands. So, there's a lot of work out there that needs to be done. So any technology that can, that can scale up and do that quickly without relying on human labor is a good thing, in my opinion. So Eric, in, in the consultant work that I do personally with architecture firms, basically helping them win more projects, increase their profitability, their businesses, we, we have this conversation about the business goals of our clients, right? The motivating factors that are motivating our clients to actually produce some sort of architectural building. And then on the other hand, the desires of, of architects that they have. And a lot of times they're not aligned, right? So a lot of times architects, um, you know, care about things like aesthetics. They care things about inhabiting the space. They care, care about things like sustainability, uh, at least at a very theoretical level. However, the clients oftentimes are driven by other factors. Maybe if it's a hospital, they're looking at patient outcomes, right? If it's a school, they may be looking at student outcomes or the ability to attract more students. So there's kind of this disjuncture. A lot of times if it's a business that does retail, they're looking at creating profit and strengthening their brand, things like that. Very rarely does this conversation of sustainability enter into a client's toolkit of things that they care about in terms of their motivating factor for doing the building right? So when we look at capitalism and the way that it's provided this incentive for people to create and to grow wealth, it's very nice how it provides this natural incentive for people to produce, right? However, it seems as if sustainability is kind of hamstringed in a sense because there's not a similar mechanism that I can see right now that's sort of causing the sustainability to happen other than 
people who care about the environment and want to make a point to realize that, Hey, we need to fix this. What, what's the, what's the, how do we fix this? Eric, how do we make it something that, that people are incentivized to do? Everything you said is right. <laughs> right. I'm not going to argue with anything you said. I totally agree with you. For the most part, what you've had is you've had a bunch of well-intentioned architects trying to do the right thing. That's the, those are the words they always tell me, right? trying to do the right thing and force it within the normal construct of the development cycle. And I myself am certainly guilty of it, right? I've gotten good at, you know, walking that walk, talking that talk, getting developers to convince them that they need to do the right thing. The trouble is it's not, it's not a good value proposition. Um, you know, I realized a long time ago that trying to guilt people into something is not going to is not going to win them over. It's not going to get them on your side and certainly not going to make them into advocates around deep green sustainable buildings. So instead, I think the biggest change that we've seen in the architecture profession is that architects, certain architects have learned how to speak the language of their clients. And the ones that do that really well are the ones that can incorporate sustainability seamlessly. I'll give you an example. Most people think developers are not interested in sustainability. And for the most part, they're right. But no one's asking the question, why would a developer be interested in sustainability? What would he or she ever care when their goal is to build the building as quickly as possible and sell it for as quickly as possible and get out, right? Put their money in and pull their money out. Sustainability does not fit into that equation. But if I can start to have conversations with them about upending their business model, about their pain points of selling the units faster, about increasing leasability, uh, tenant um, the, the length of time, I'm blanking on the word, but the length of time a tenant stays within a space, all of these are their pain points. So by learning what, what ails them and what they're struggling with, I can change my value proposition to that. I can really show them that as, a, an, as an architect and a professional problem solver, I can find ways to help them with their problems, not mine, not my personal agenda, not any of that. I found that as I've gotten older, I've become even more kind of agnostic in terms of what technology to use because I'm, I'm really just in service to my client like any good architect should be. And so to that end, I want to build the best building they can build, but I want to solve all as many of their problems as I can. And so our conversations very early on change right away. And I, and I do this by asking very different questions than I think most architects that are trying to force sustainability in are, are asking. What are these kind of questions? First, we start in the very first meeting. I lay out all of the assumptions on the table. I have them all sp spoken and I tell them that we're doing this. And I say, what are the assumptions that we're going to do? And the first assumptions people start to rattle off are the ones that you'd expect. Well, we got to build a building on time. Of course, we got to build it on budget. Yes, naturally. What are the other assumptions? And so once you start mining these, you start to realize they assume that we're going to have air conditioning. They assume that we're going to have a, cur a curtain wall. They assume that we're going to do the bare minimum of insulation. They assume that we're just going to go with the cheapest thing possible. And what's interesting is by having the entire project team, including the client in the room, and we start to do these things, you start to realize, um, well, maybe we don't need to. These assumptions can then get even bigger. They assume that a building is going to have drywall in it. Why? Who, who, where, where was that in the project brief? Where was that in the, in the owner's project requirements? that it must have drywall, uh, maybe there's something better. And so what I do is I just create the possibility very early on that let's, let's, let's say these assumptions out loud, let's make sure that we're all hearing them, and then let's see what else we can come up with. And when you start to eliminate things like you're not, maybe, maybe not gonna have air conditioning, maybe, maybe not gonna have drywall, then you can expand those even further. Well, maybe you're not gonna have a parking lot. Maybe you don't need to. Maybe we can help you pick a site where your employees don't need a parking lot because it's a certainly big expensive waste of money, all that asphalt and all that paving and those big pipes and those guys with no neck that sit around and shovel those pipes. Like that's a lot of money that you're spending. Um, and then those assumptions can go even more profound. If we're no longer assuming that there's just always going to be air conditioning or drywall or a parking lot, maybe we can also assume that you'll never have a sick employee and they, they're kind of taken aback by that. And our work as architects affects all of those outcomes. I can essentially deliver you a building that'll have higher worker productivity and less, less sick employees. It's not magic. 
it's it's proven. My buddies at at Stoke, and if you go to stok.com, you can download this. They have a report on the value benefits of high performance buildings, and they've shown that essentially, if you do it right, a high performance building is equivalent to essentially a six six percent improvement in profit, which for some companies is their entire profit margin. So that's the kind of language that we're talking about, and um, and if you can speak your client's language in that way, where you focus on their pain points and what what you know, what they're worried about and what their KPIs are, then suddenly your design solutions seem like, like genius visionary things that, that they never anticipated. And I think that's the value that architects can bring in the 21st century. And you also mentioned you don't really see the big innovations happening from inside, right? So what we're, this conversation right now, we're talking about kind of internal innovation, having this client conversation. When we look at other industries, like Elon Musk is a great example, coming from outside the car industry and disrupting the industry. Do you see this on the horizon? Is there anything out there right now where you see outside players coming in and rethinking what we're doing here in the AEC industry? Absolutely. Think about, think about how just the, the idea of ownership has changed in the last five years, which is short enough that everybody remembers before five years ago. The largest hotelier in the world doesn't own any hotels, Airbnb. The largest content provider in the world, Facebook, doesn't produce any of its own content. The largest taxi company in the world, Uber, doesn't own any taxis. How do you think that's going to upend things for you as an architect, for people that don't own anything anymore? There's a town outside of New York called Summit, New Jersey, and they were going to build a parking garage as their last mile typical transit stop, right? They, they had a train station that goes, takes everybody commuting into New York. They were going to build, I think, a $15 million parking garage. They chose not to. They chose instead to just give everybody vouchers for Uber and Lyft. They're essentially paying their residents to not build a building. That should be a huge wake-up call to every architect listening because suddenly that, that means that's, that's a project. I mean, granted, it probably would have been a hideously ugly parking garage, but still, that was a project that you're now not going to get because this company decided to do this decentralized approach. So the disruption is already happening. You're just not feeling it yet. This is an interesting conversation about the disruption is happening. I got you thinking. I can, I can see it in your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so th this conversation about the disruption is happening, but you're not feeling it yet is something that I'm seeing from where I sit as well, that I get phone calls or emails all the time from architects who are experiencing the disruption, but they didn't recognize it happening when it started 10 years ago, right? And so now they're suffering. It's like, boom, suddenly they, their cash flow is negative. Suddenly they're having to lay off people in the middle of the biggest, one of the biggest boom times of recent history, right? A lot of firms are full out. So let, let's, so Eric, you have this mission and this passion and you have taken a different than, let's say a non-standard traditional route in terms of practicing architecture. Talk to me about how you've thought about using your passion and your skills in architecture to make the impact and chart your own career path as opposed to trying to practice and do buildings directly. It's, it's, it's been such a crazy journey. And I don't, I don't even know where to begin at this point because I'm so old. <laughs> I'm so old now that, uh, you know, it's, it almost seems ridiculous to go back to the beginning. Uh, but I think, I think what I had going for me early on, even back in architecture school, was that I knew I didn't want a traditional career. I wanted to have a career that had impact. And I didn't know what that meant yet. But I, I knew that I wanted to be impactful on the profession. I wanted to change the, the conversations going on in architecture. And I'm not even entirely sure why I wanted that so badly at age 17. But I, but I felt very, very strongly about it and certainly made it known to my professors, who saw me as a, probably a huge pain in the ass. Uh, uh, but but I, I, that's what I knew I wanted. And I think part of it was that if you're – if you're born a, a, a privileged, privileged white male, as I was, uh, there are certain things that you can almost take for granted. And, and, um, and I saw this, this kind of uh, offering that was laid out before me, and it didn't appeal to me. And I, again, I'm not entirely sure why. I'm not sure if it was because my father had a very, he was a surgeon and he had a very 
non-traditional practice. So maybe he had laid the blueprint for me. Um, or because I was, I was lucky enough to have mentors er, very early on. I mean, starting at age 10, coaching me about the methods of practice. But by the time I reached architecture school, the idea of, of you're going to work, you know, you grew up in Philadelphia, so you're going to work for one of these five firms and you're, you'll be, you'll be made an associate very quickly and then you'll be a partner and you'll join the AIA and drive a Subaru and wear all black like that, that whole thing. It just didn't, it didn't interest me at all. In fact, it was so clear in my head and so clear in my professor's heads who were, who wanted it for me that, that I almost felt like I'd already done it, which I know sounds silly. Cause I, at that point I was, you know, I'm in, you know, late teens, early twenties. But I, I felt almost like that it, it, that I wasn't giving up anything by skipping out on that. That if I if I really if I tried something and failed, I could always go back to it. And so, you know, when I was basically in high school, I started writing away to to former Frank Lloyd Wright apprentices, trying to find some way to have impact. And then old you know all the old passive house folks from the 1970s that were doing those those buildings that clearly were oriented to north, right? Those those folks. You know, and then then the um, the old permaculture groups, like all these weird old hippie groups that were doing what I thought of as as truly environmental, cutting edge, connected to the earth building. That's who I was reaching out to because the idea of a, a corporate, you know, mid sized firm, eh, it didn't excite me at all. Uh, so, so it, you know, it I had an advantage that I think a lot of other people didn't, which is I saw the future that was being offered and I could reject it, knowing that. Worst comes to worst, I could always grab it again. But then I had to figure out what that means. And I think, and I think you struggle with this as well, is, is how do you define a practice for yourself if you don't want to do anything normal, right? Um, so I started by saying, I'm only going to do projects that are, that are as green as I can make them. I'm not interested in non-green projects. And I made that clear to clients. And it, and it scared off a lot of clients. <laughs> um, but it also started to eventually attract clients too. And I think, I think um, for anybody listening that's wondering how to start, there is no easy way. You have to just be willing to say no. And so being stubborn can be a good thing if you're really clear on the, on the end goal and clear on the end prize. And so that's, that's how I started. And what is your business model right now? Now my business model is kind of interesting because I'm in a wonderful position. Um, I, um, there's a large biz building science company called Morrison Hirschfield and I am their sustainability disruptor. It's a, it's a title that I got to make up, but essentially my role in the company is, is to go into projects and make them better. And this company is no small company. There's over a thousand employees across 21 offices all throughout Canada and the U S so we, we have our fingers in a lot of different projects. So through this, I'm the person that can jump in and say, well, we can make this project net zero and here's how, or we can use Passive House to achieve this, or let's use uh, prefabricated mass timber CLT to, um, to improve the embodied carbon. And let's find a way if we can monetize the carbon offsets we're producing as a byproduct and see if there's something there. Right now, we're, we're, I'm trying to talk to insurance companies to see if, if they'll lower the cost of insurance for our clients, if they build a, a truly healthy building, I'm getting to work on lots of really fun stuff that, that I've always you know, wanted to explore. And now I have the room to, but in addition to that, I'm, I'm speaking at 50 events a year all across, all across America. I'm, um, you know, I've written 11 books now. So those things kind of, um, you know, they, they persist. They're kind of out there. And, um, and a lot of, half the books are, are, are really focused on people studying for the license exam. So that it's, I'm in a weird place where I'll go to a conference in Alabama and someone will come up and go, oh, I, I used your guides to pass the ARE or something. Like that. So there, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very lucky and fortunate to um, kind of had exposure to all this stuff. It's uh, right now I'm consulting full time. Basically everybody I meet, I'm asking myself, what can I do for them that would have value? What problems are they struggling with? That I can, to them. I really consider myself and I consider all architects professional problem solvers. And I think if you're running a firm and you're trying to run it in the 20th century model or even worse in the 19th century model of standard practice, you're struggling, not making a profit, and maybe you could kind of step back and say, what problems are my clients having that I could potentially innovate them for? 
Now, regarding the business model, this is interesting, this position that you have for this, it's a construction company, is that right? No, it's a building science consulting firm. It's mostly engineers. Excellent. And then how does this building science consulting firm, how do they, how do they acquire clients? What's their business model? What would make a, a client or a, a, a building, someone who's going to be doing a project, bring them in? So this was part of my decision making was that I didn't want to just jump into a, after having my own firm for 20 years, um, I didn't want to just jump into some large architecture firm and then suddenly be competition to lots of my friends. <laughs> so um, I, I went, I went looking for a consulting firm specifically. So that way I could work with every architect that I'm with. Sounds selfish, I know, but they're, they're doing cool stuff. So I, I chose Morrison Hirschfield because they're, they're all engineers. They're, most of their clients are architects and we're the ones that are brought in to fix problems. Architects kind of themselves into the corner too. So architects will design some cool, wild, curvy, weird facade. And um, my crew is the one that figures out how to make it work thermally or in terms of water protection or in terms of health or whatever, you know, whatever issue it is that they're, they're grappling with. Great. Well, thanks, Eric. And apologies to our listeners. There's a little bit of the sound going in and out there. I, we get, we got the answer though, which is that you were looking specifically for a firm or a company that wouldn't be in competition with different architecture firms. Now, was this a position specifically that this company was looking to fill or was this something where you knew them and, and you guys saw a need here and you created a position? No, I, this was, this was, uh, this was a company that I'd known for years and, um, and they'd started talking to me about five years ago in a very friendly way. And then every time I was kind of in a city where one of their offices was, I would, I'd, you know, I'd go and have lunch with somebody, just talk to them. So I took my time, I, you know, so over, over, over probably a five year period, I was having various conversations with various uh, senior associates and VPs and so forth, just to figure out what, what we could do together. And, um, and so this position is one that, that they created specifically for me is kind of unusual. Excellent. Well, I think that that's a great example of the, the potential out there for our listeners to create a path of their own, right? That we don't always have to sit back and, and passively wait for the right opportunity. Look for a firm out there that's hiring for the exact position we want to have. But I think it's, it's inspiring to see how you have charted a course and been firm about saying no, as you mentioned, and have been able to basically create this opportunity and be part of a larger team. Yeah, but luckily I was in a position where on my own, I could always just drum up consulting work and find, find problems to solve, essentially. That's kind of how I think of it. And then, but I knew that I wanted to be part of a larger firm that was working on really big buildings so I could jump in. So, you know, we, we're working on um, thousands of projects in a typical year. So I, I get to essentially come through and <laughs> pick and choose what, you know, where I can have the most impact. But it's, it's really about... You know, it's, I have a 10 year old daughter when she's my age, the world is going to be a very different place. And so how can I throw my stones in such a way that they have the most impact that they create the most ripples and waves and hopefully change things for the better. That's really where my full, my full mindset is right now. And, um, and because, you know, because of the climate crisis, I, it almost seems like a luxury to go and design a house for, for rich people. I mean, it almost seems like an absurdity at this point in my life. I, I think for the next five years, 10 years, however long it takes, um, I'd rather be working in this fight with thousands of other great sustainability consultants to try to make this um, future a little more bright. Awesome. Eric, well, hey, thank you for joining us. Eric Corey Freed, thank you for joining us here on The Business of Architecture. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, for people to get a hold of you, to people to follow what you're doing, where should they go? There's a bunch of places they can go. One of the best places is probably Twitter, uh, at Eric Corey Freed uh, is my handle. Um, and I post a lot of things that I'm grappling with, including, including our latest research. Uh, my company is at morrisonhirschfield.com, which I know is not easy to spell, but figure it out. Or, uh, or if you're studying for the ARES, and you're looking for study guides, you can go to architectexamprep.com too and check out our books, which Dave just said and I, which are kind of fun. 
So that's, then, that's architectexamprep.com. Is that correct? Yes. And then if you want more, in, if you want more information on the, on the idea of growing buildings using biology, go to prostruction.life, which is kind of prostruction.life. Yeah. Prostruction is the opposite of construction. Got it. Thanks, Eric. Thank you so much. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.